we started coming here and talking to the sports psychologist and focusing on our well-being and our, our mental health and our physical health, ever since we started making those small adjustments and adding those things as a part of our daily routines have definitely made us just better people in general and that definitely reflects in game. When you feel good about yourself, you play good and I think that's why we all have like so much confidence and um, when we come here to boot camp to talk to the physiologist and the nutritionist and the psychologist and then we go out to events, we feel so prepared for like every obstacle that comes our way and I think that's where the confidence is definitely coming from. You wanna dance? Let's go. You wanna rock? Let's go. You wanna... Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, we're gonna just jump into the world of, of esports. I'm Imari Oliver, obviously from the, the photo, and I'll let Heather uh, introduce her, uh, herself. So, uh, Heather, before we dive in into the world, let's talk to tell everyone about your background and your experiences. Sure. So my name is Heather Garozo. Because the esports world would know me as Sapphire. We all have gaming aliases. So I work for Team Dignitas. So it's one of the oldest esports organizations still in operation today. We're owned by HBSC, which also owns the Philadelphia 76ers, Prudential Center in Newark, the New Jersey Devils, Crystal Palace Football Club, among another uh, sports and entertainment properties. So I'm the director of marketing there, working with our global esports teams. Um, it's not a career that I ever <laughs> planned for. I, I started in communications and PR in New York at a, an agency there, and I always had an interest in gaming, so I used that to, to work in PR with big clients like AT&T, Motorola, Gatorade, as they tried to start to navigate this gaming world. Um, and then I moved on to an insurance company working for a Fortune 500 company, Digital Marketing, but I never thought that that would lead me to the gaming space. I was always gaming on the side. It was something that I really didn't tell a lot of people about um, playing professionally, but um, here I am about 15 years later into my eSports career, and now I'm doing this professionally. Right. Now, is everyone in the audience, are you guys familiar with eSports and competitive video games? Anyone ever hear of eSports? <laughs> <laughs> uh, simply, eSports is professional competitive video games where we actually pay to watch other people play video games. Sometimes we pay you know, we, at stadiums and arenas, and sometimes we also, and I'll let Heather jump in, and we do a lot, watch people play online. So it is a big, big industry. They sell out arenas all around the world. Um, what are your thoughts? Like, if you had to explain to people who are not familiar with esports and competitive video gaming, how would you normally explain that to them? So esports, it, it's rivaling some of the top professional sports leagues in terms of the audience. One of the events I participated in, it had 46 million viewers. It's an event called Intel Extreme Masters in Poland. Who would have thought 46 million people? So um, there's many different games, just like in traditional sports, there's many different esports games. So some are shooter games, some are sports, some are uh, real-time strategy games, and they're either with a teammate or you're playing solo. And while the game relies on your individual skill, your quickness, your reaction time, a lot of those games also depend on teamwork, communication, leadership. They're incredible life skills that could apply to traditional sports as well. Mm -hmm. A lot of the people that I compete with are former athletes themselves. They played in high school or college level. Mm -hmm. So describe to me a day in the life of a pro video game, a pro video gamer. Like, what, does they, what do they do? Do they just wake up and before they brush their teeth, do they start playing <laughs> video games? Or what does that look like? Years ago, that was the case. Years <laughs> ago, they used to sleep until maybe 3 p.m., then got up and played. But that's definitely changed now that we're working with professional sports teams. So they have a very strict schedule. Our teams wake up around 9, 10 a.m. They get to sleep in in a bit. Um, our players are required to go to the gym, get exercise in, because we truly believe that physical training is they're gonna, gonna help them in the game as well. Um, depending on what team it is, they may live in a team house and have a catered meal from a chef. We work with a nutritionist at the Philadelphia 76ers to provide us with our recipes. Mm -hmm. After that, the player will work on their individual practice. 
So they're working on their reaction time, their aim, their quickness. Um, they're also studying tape of both themselves and their opponents for an upcoming match so they can essentially counter strat the opponent, come up with new strategies. Around 3 p.m. they'll start playing with their team. Mm -hmm. So they'll have scrimmages against other practice teams, sometimes in person, sometimes online. Um, at about 8 or 9 p.m. they'll wrap up team practice and then they are asked to live stream on Twitch. So Twitch is the biggest live streaming website. It's a great way for players to build their individual brands, show off their sponsors, and gain some additional revenue. Mm -hmm. So they're playing from about 10 to, about playing till about 10 p.m. Okay. Um, and then start so the they game. play for about 12, 13, 14 hours a day, or what do you think? Uh, previously, yes, but we've actually been working with you know, sports psychologists, team doctors, about cutting back on the amount of practice and, and introducing more rest, mm -hmm. relaxation, meditation, uh, as ways to actually pr improve your physical mm -hmm. and mental health. Right. When I tell people that you can now get a scholarship to play video games, what are, you, what are your thoughts on that? Because people are always astounded that they're actually now giving athletic scholarships to play video games. What, what were your thoughts when you first heard that? When I first heard it, I was like, where was this when I was in college? When I was in college, I think I won a $25 Best Buy gift card, and I thought that was the greatest thing. And now you get scholarships, but it's great, because the, the kids are going to do it anyways. They're going to be playing. Why not harness it in, in a, a great way that um, you can pay off your school, um, you can meet other people by competing in leagues with your, your, your people at your school. So I think it's a great next step. Um, it's going to inspire a lot of people, especially women. There's a lot of women gamers out there, but they don't know how to get started or where to meet other women gamers. So I think mm -hmm. having something on the more high school or collegiate level really helps with that. Right. It brings me to an interesting question. We were talking backstage, like, how do you define a gamer? Because everyone, like, when you see the, the desktops and the PCs, they're like, well, those are gamers. But where do you think, like, people that play Candy Crush or any of those other games, like, are they considered gamers in some extent, even though it's much more casual and more social? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's definitely different ways to define it, just like there would be different ways to define an athlete. Um, you know, sometimes I go shoot hoops in my driveway. Does that make it athlete? Yeah, I guess so, but it doesn't necessarily make me competitive. So there's, there, you know, there's different levels to it. Um, being in competitive usually means like you're competing against other people, um, but you can also be just playing against yourself, trying to get better and trying to study the game. But there's a, there's a lot of gamers out there. There's not as many competitive players, but I think there's starting to be more interest now that people understand how skilled and how difficult it is to be a pro player, and people really respect that skill. So as, as, as we're talking about skills, uh, well, well, two questions. The first one is, what skills or superpowers did you find most important in your role of what you're doing now? And then the second question, part of that question is, what are some of the skills overall that you learned just by playing video games? Because a lot of times parents will come to me and go, well, my child or someone in my family just all they want to do is play video games all day and I don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. So how would you describe that? So first, your skills mm -hmm. and superpowers. So you have to have an incredible work ethic. The moment you become lazy, the moment you come slack off, someone is going to work harder than you and take your place. Um, you also have to know how to build a brand. You essentially have to be an entrepreneur. I, I had to build my brand starting at the age of 14 when I was playing. You need to be able to get yourself seen, especially because a lot of this happens online. So you have to be able to show off not just your physical skill, but what are the things that make you special as a brand, as a personality. Um, you also have to have great leadership ability, teamwork, and communication. So the game I play is called Counter-Strike. It's a five-person shooter game. And when you're the leader, you have to guide the four other people on the team. You're the shot caller. You have to understand what they're doing. And it's, it's very difficult. You, you need to have your teammates believe in you. You have to have quick, effective communication, mm -hmm. um, great team chemistry. And those are a lot of things that I've been able to kind of apply to the business world. Even things as simple as like life skills. You know, I've been traveling on my own since I was 15. I've been traveling globally for tournaments. And you have to figure things out yourself. You, you're getting people you know, throwing these contracts at you, money at you, like, what do I do with it? How, how do I navigate this world? 
Um, and so those are definitely, I think, important skills that I would love to show off to parents that see their kids playing and, you know, what do I do with this? There's something on the news a couple weeks ago, um, a news anchor, she smashed her kids' iPads because they were playing so much Fortnite, and she said, this is toxic behavior. And, you know, I couldn't help myself but go on Twitter and, and respond to her. I said, the, there's so many incredible things. I've met so many great people. I have an incredible career. I've traveled the globe all because of video games. Um, my parents weren't too fond of it, but they allowed me to, to do something with it. They realized that there was a future in this. And um, I think you can take a lot of these skills. And, and I'd love to see parents harness their children's love for video games and put it towards a future career. So you manage both uh, men and women teams, what is the difference or what do you see as the difference when you manage men teams versus women teams, a women team? Uh, what's, it's interesting and I, I don't think a lot of people will believe it that our women's team play far more than our men's teams. We had to cut them off. We had to tell them that they had to stop playing. Um, I think a lot of it's because they have, feel like they have something to prove. Um, you know, we're, we're constantly kind of harassed, we're constantly under a microscope. Some of the words we've been called, I would never in my <laughs> lifetime utter those words. Um, so I think they're always looking to be able to prove something. So they play a lot. Um, they also understand, our women understand about like, the importance of building a brand to being able to stand out because it, it, it's definitely hard to kind of stand out in what they traditionally called, you know, a men's world. Um, so they're, they're always working to do a little extra, mm -hmm. but you know, with our males team too, everyone has a different way they need to be communicated, worked with. Mm -hmm. um, so we work with kind of our, our team dot sports science to mm -hmm. understand what each player's needs are. So not everyone is going to be a, a professional gamer. So what are some of the other roles that you're seeing in esports and mm -hmm. professional video games for women mm -hmm. beyond just being a gamer or even a team manager? Sure. Of talent? The great thing that now that esports is similar to traditional sports, a lot of those careers also apply to esports. So um, we have PR and marketing, advertising, um, journalism. There's also the sales side is a big component mm -hmm. as non-endemic brands are getting into the space. We have team lawyers, accountants, sports psychologists, nutritionists, chefs, the whole nine yards, similar to, mm -hmm. just like at the 76ers, all the careers that they have, we're starting to have that in esports as well. Mm -hmm. How do you, you guys relate to or interact with the, the 76ers, a the professional basketball team and, and gamers you mentioned, like, because a lot of the athletes are gamers, so mm -hmm. how are you seeing this interaction beginning to happen mm -hmm. and how has it developed over time? So previously when the 76ers bought our team, I think we were a little standoffish. We did some content together, the NBA players and our players. And you know, we just felt we were kind of from two different worlds. We didn't really mix, it was a little awkward. Um, but now as gaming is becoming more popular, thank you Drake and Ninja, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, the NBA players are starting to say, yeah, gaming's pretty cool. I'm playing it in my free time. So now we have the NBA players. We have Ben Simmons, Joel Embiid coming to us saying, hey, we want to play Fortnite with you. We want to play PUBG with you guys. Um, so now we kind of have this deeper understanding and, and we understand that there's a lot of similarities between our two worlds. And we have a lot of fun playing games together too and, and live streaming on Twitch. Right. How would you encourage more women to get in, to see esports and video games as a viable career mm -hmm. and, and as an opportunity to, for them to tap into a lot of the other skills that they may have? It's definitely important to have female mentors, female role models, mm -hmm. um, harnessing at a young age. Back when I played, I was the only female in the room. I was very embarrassed to say that I played. I was a you know, multi-sport varsity athlete in high school and gaming was seen as lazy, it was seen as unsocial and I didn't want to admit to people I played. Then there were, there were no role models to look up to to say, maybe this is okay to do this. Um, so I, I do really feel um, it's important that my women's team serve as pioneers, they serve as mentors. So we work with um, the University of California's school system to attend summer camps. Our women gamers meet with the other players there that, you know, it's the first time coming to school. They want to network with other people. They happen to like games. 
So our players help bring those people together. They help demonstrate not just the skills you need in a game, but the skills to be a part of this industry and future career opportunities as well. What were uh, a couple of highlights of your career? I know you won some things, so let's talk about that. I won that. some things, yeah. So in 2012, um, I played in the Women's World Cup in Paris. So it's a nation's event. I was playing for Team USA. Um, the American team had won um, five world championships since 2003, so they had won the most events. Um, I was the new person to the team. I always wanted to play with them and I kept working, uh, it took me a decade to get on that team and I finally got on that team. It was a lot of pressure because I, I was a new person, I didn't want to let the team down. Uh, we were playing against the German team in the finals. We got smashed in game one, absolutely destroyed. In game two, we were down three to 12 and you have to win uh, first to 16 wins. So it's pretty impossible odds. We came back and won in overtime. We still had to win more, it was the best of three. This time we were down one to 14. I'm like, well, this is it, you know, we're, we're about to lose. Um, we pushed it into triple overtime. We won, there's pictures of me immediately falling on stage crying um, because it's a nation's cup, they play the national anthem. So I had a flag <laughs> over my shoulders, a gold medal around my neck and national anthem was playing and it was just, it was just an incredible feeling. Um, one of the best parts too was you know, the Americans hadn't won an event in several years, not just female events, but gaming in general. Um, so even the Team USA male team was behind us, and they are just absolute superstars, millions of fans, and they were cheering for us, so it really kind of helped validate it. That was a great moment. One of the other great moments, too, is that I'm a, a big sports nut. I love the Green Bay Packers. They are my life. And some of the Packers have come to me saying they're fans of my play. And I'm just like, my mind was blown. My, my dad and my uncles are so incredibly jealous. I try to play it cool, um, but it's just like the highlight of my life that I impressed my favorite athletes. I love it. Mm -hmm. um, what are some of the trends that you're seeing driving the growth in esports? Like where, you know, where it was a few years ago, mm -hmm. we just see it keep getting bigger and bigger. What other trends are you seeing that are just driving the growth of esports? So first off is the investment from the traditional sports team. So our team was first to be bought by a traditional sports team in North America, but now we see almost 30 teams are invested from the NBA. We see NFL owners, the Dallas Cowboys have a team and they're building a facility in their beautiful AT&T Stadium. Um, so that's, that's massive. It's, it's bringing some kind of validation to it essentially being a sport in a way. Um, we also see a lot of non-endemic brands coming into this space. So our team recently announced a partnership with Champion Sports. So they are going to be producing merchandise for us. Um, not, not only do we have a game jersey, but essentially we have warm-ups just like an athlete. So we have joggers, we have hoodies, mm -hmm. um, all that kind of clothing. We've also worked with companies like Mountain Dew and Buffalo Wild Wings. So, there's a lot of interest from the non-endemic space. From the female perspective too, we've, we've been in, involved in an event that was sponsored by Sephora. Mm -hmm. And I've never seen so many females come out of the woodworks on Twitter to say, wow, you know, I've been acknowledged. It's not just male brands entering the space, but female brands. Mm -hmm. So I think that's gonna become even bigger over the coming years. Right, great. Do we have any questions for the audience? Wanna give some people some, yes? I see a hand over, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, Hi, um, Amaria, I can assure you that those of us in sports business are paying attention to esports, mm -hmm. for sure. Um, I do a lot of work in online harassment, and especially coming out of Gamergate, this was a very important thing that women needed support for, but didn't really have a lot of information on, ways through it. Um, can you talk a little bit about what your experience has been with online harassment and are there support uh, things in place for you when you experience it? It's pretty bad. Um, I've been called absolutely terrible names. Um, it's, it's incredibly demoralizing. Um, now that I'm older, I, I think I'm a little stronger and able to block it out, but I, I really worry for our younger players. 
and especially the, the young women, the, the preteens, the teens that want to get into it, it's scary when their parents see what people say um, online. Um, I, I did feel better years ago when you know, I made a tweet, I was feeling particular awful, awful because of what someone said to me, and I had a lot of pro players respond to that saying, and they're male players, and they're saying, you know what, Heather, I was called this, and I was called this, and I was called this. And it made me feel a little better in the sense like, okay, I'm not the only one. It's not just because I'm a woman. It's kind of that, the, what happens being online, someone's behind the computer, they can say whatever they want. So I think it's important to have strong networks, people that you can rely on. There's one that I really look to called the Smash Sisters. Mm -hmm. So um, from a woman named Lil Chen, and it's for a game called Super Smash Brother Melee. And she put together this female community so that when you go to an event, you immediately have friends there. You immediately have people that you can go and network with. I'm doing the same with the game called Counter-Strike that I play, is creating these online networks of females so that we have other people we can talk to and talk to and don't feel like we're the only ones mm -hmm. that um, we feel some level of support. I think it's great having those mentors and those communities you can go to. Okay. Any other questions? So you know everything there is to know about esports, <laughs> and you're going to go out immediately after this event and download a game or go on Steam and start playing uh, video games. Okay. Yeah. You. Hi. Um, I am just going to admit I'm has been very skeptical around esports. Mm -hmm. I've played sports since I could walk. Like field sports mostly, um, so it's definitely a weird concept for me. Um, but one of the things I'm really curious about, um, we've heard a lot about the research that's been done on women in traditional sports and leadership. Is there any, has, is there any research on women in, being involved in esports and kind of the effects, positive effects hopefully on them? I think there's, this starting yeah. to become more research, but we talked about this before. There's a lot of different numbers. People have different sources. Um, I'm the same way. I strongly believe that there's a massive amount of female players, but I don't have a way to prove it yet. Um, so I think the, the science and the numbers behind it are, are still coming together. Mm -hmm. But you know, I, I have seen a few kind of interesting pieces like females, um, of the female players, actually 39% are hardcore mm -hmm. compared to like males, 19% are hardcore. So the ones that do play are very, very dedicated and into it. Um, there's also another great stat about females spend more than males when, mm -hmm. when they really get into video gaming. But the numbers are still a bit immature, um, but it's definitely growing. I used to be the only female in the room, stand out like a sore thumb, but it's, it's getting better. And I, I think it's gonna keep improving. And I think overall, when you just look at video games, not esports, when you just look at video games, I think it's slightly higher women. When you just look at overall, and that includes like casual games or any other sort of, of, of gaming in that ilk, so it's not just esports, but the broader thing, there's a lot of women that are playing video games and sometimes even more than men. And as we mentioned with the careers, you, you know, programmers, developers, marketers, all those different roles that you could take from, they're very transferable to the world of, of nice. esports. And just one last you know, thing for you. Uh, you mentioned that you, you, you led a team of 40 uh, people in World of Warcraft. Can you just explain, like, because oh, I, yeah. I think it's important to talk about like, yeah, leadership no, and, and what you've learned. This was years ago. My mom's like, you know, what are you doing, Heather? Um, this is just absolutely ridiculous. And um, I was just playing World of Warcraft. This is just for fun on the side, but they have something called raids, and you have to lead 40 people in a group. And they have to be in very particular spots and do things at a very particular time. So you're, you have to know exactly what those other 39 people are doing. And I thought it was like this pretty incredible skill. Not everyone can do it. And finally, I think a couple of years later, um, some research came out that people that play World of Warcraft as like a, a raid leader are statistically like better managers or like some are in C-level suite jobs. Um, so I thought that was fascinating, but I'd love to see more of that. I really want to see it kind of focus on the esports perspective. What are these skills that I, I'm gaining by competing do for you know, kind of future careers? Yeah. Any last questions? Before we, uh, sure.
There's a lot of, a lot of startups that want to get into this space. Um, so you, you're going to see a lot of high school leagues come up, collegiate leagues. Um, there is no kind of unifying league right now, but there, there are some events on the East Coast. Um, we're going to be doing something with Team Dignitas in Philadelphia where we start to, to build up that scene. It's, it's very new. It's only kind of started this, this past year but it's, it's starting to form and there's a lot of interest around it because people are playing already in their homes and they, they want to look for a more organized way to do it. So I think it's coming. Okay. Well, thank you guys for having us. Thank you. Uh, thank you.